try not to mess with the tech up here too much. I might get in trouble. There we go. Sometimes the mic, it's interesting, is like right in front of your view of the people that are in front of you. So like sometimes all I see is a mic instead of John. And it's like, what'd you say? <laughs> Good. Good. I'm also sorry. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. So we are back. Um, we've been doing a study on stewardship. And we are currently sitting on, I believe, week four. Yep, I wrote it out. Week four it is. Um, I'm losing track of the weeks because of how much the study has been condensed. We're, like, in the study, we're, like, up to week 10 or something like that right now. But we're on week four here. So this week we are studying rest and time. And they kind of sound one, of the, one and the same. When you say time, you would think that rest would be included in it. But they are kind of, there's a, there's a little deviation there that we'll get into. So stewarding our rest. And again, these notes, um, they're two weeks worth that I condensed down into one set of notes for you, only one sided this time, so you don't have to play around with the origami of trying to figure out how to fold it in the right shape and stuff. Uh, anybody who wanted week one's notes, okay, back on the table back there, I didn't bring them up front this time, I learned my lesson, there's notes back there for week one if you'd like them. There's just a few, so I know there was just a few of you who wanted them, so they're there. You can have those. So let's look at this, this time and rest idea. It's, it's, um, it's about time, right? I needed a rest from all that money talk stuff. Um, some of you got it. Somebody got it back there. Thank you. So let me ask a question to start us off. What are some things that we might want to know about? We're going to look particularly at rest first. Right? So we're going to go through rest, and then we're going to look at the time aspect. And we'll probably spend more time in the rest section than we do the time aspect, because I feel like we, we touch on a little bit of both at the same time. Uh, I'm going to be all morning long with this. Um, so what are some things that we might want to know particularly about rest as we go into a study of it? What, what can you think of that would be important as we're trying to look at rest from a biblical perspective? What kind of things might we want to know? That's an excellent question. What are we talking about? What kind of rest are we talking about? Is it a spiritual rest? Is it a physical rest? Important to know. Answering your question, we're going to talk a little bit about both of them. Anything else? Used our phrase. I'm going to take one more. I'm going to make us think of one more, and then we'll move on. Who's going to be the one? to move us forward with one more thing that we should think of when we study rest. What might we want to study? Creation? Mm -hmm. So that would be an important thing for us to look at when we're trying to figure out what rest is and what that means for us in our life is to go through that account of creation. That's true. It kind of, so for me, I look at this every time I come to a section of, of or a topic or anything, I, I kind of do a, a, the, five, um, the five W's, the who, what, when, where, why. If you take that mentality when you come to a study, you're going to get a pretty well-rounded idea of what's going on, and you're going to have a pretty good study in depth. It's just a good format to go by. So, you know, an example of that would be like, well, who rested in the Bible? You know, if I want to study rest, who is resting in the Bible? Who should I look at? Multiple different uh, areas we could look at and people. Let's talk first about what does the Bible say about rest in the Old Testament. Um, you can kind of follow along in your notes there. Again, the notes are, are, are slim simply because I want you to be able to kind of jot down the things that you think are important that I'm saying here because I'm saying a lot. So, Old Testament. What does it say? Genesis 2, 1 through 3. Riley mentioned the account of creation. Let's look at that real quick. I'm going to read it. Genesis 2, 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. 
and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done. All right, the word rest is used there twice. So what are we talking about with this particular rest here? Question to you guys. Do you think that this type of rest was like a um, napping type of rest? No. It was... It wasn't because he was tired at all. The, the, the Lord has already ceased to doing all that work. Uh, it's not maybe the Lord that he was going to rest. Yes, you're exactly right. Any other points on that? The simple, the short answer is no. Just like John said, he was quick, he was fast. This isn't like a God took a nap type of rest. And one of the becauses, like, well, you say, well, why is that? I give a little bit of scripture to go along with that. John 5, verse 17. This has to do with, um, this, is, this is the context of this is after Jesus had healed the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. He was lame for 38 years. And the pool comes in, the pool comes out. Um, there was a specific time period when you were supposed to get in it, and then hopefully you would be healed. And he, he had, didn't have anybody to put him in the pool. Everybody would rush in before him. Well, Jesus heals him. And then Jesus is being questioned by the religious rulers of the time because of the day that he did the healing on, which was the Sabbath. And they, Jesus said to them, this is... Uh, John 5 verse 17 my father is working until now and I am working so here Jesus is saying that God is still working so he's been working he's still working this rest that happened in creation was not uh, a stopping of God doing he didn't just rest and take a nap and go to bed and that was it so what does this kind of mean for us as we look at that particular part right there, that first question? Well, it means that rest has more to it than what initially comes to our minds when we think of rest, right? We just kind of rehashed a little bit of rest in the sense that for me, rest is like, um, you know, a nap is always nice. I used to, I'm getting to the point at the, where I do like naps. I've, I've crossed that, that threshold. I do like a nap every now and then. Um, rest to me, or you could be sitting down in your chair for a little bit and just reading a book or something. That isn't the type of rest that we're talking about here in Scripture and what God did. A second question that came to mind when we're dealing with this passage in Genesis, um, did the rest that is mentioned right here in this particular passage, did it ever end? Hmm? Depends on how you look at it. Could be, yeah. Well, let me... Let me let me read that last little portion of the passage, Genesis 2, 1 through 3. This is uh, verse 3. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. If you go further, does the rest ever end? Is there a passage of scripture afterwards that it's like, okay, and then God stopped resting and he got back to whatever he was doing? Particular item. item. Yes. So the idea, you're right. So the idea is that God essentially did not stop resting in this particular sense here of the word. He did rest from that particular act of creation. That is done. That is complete. But he, this, this rest that we're talking about, and we're, you're going to see, I'm kind of dragging you along a little bit here, and I will for this first couple bits, because we're getting to a really important piece of essentially theology and how we understand God and rest as he sees it. So the idea here is that, no, his rest didn't end. This rest never stopped. 
Yes, the creation stopped, as John said, he rested from that particular work, but this idea of rest did not stop. It continues on, and we'll see why. We're going to keep going. So all this together, we got the two questions in there. What does this mean all together? Number one, God's rest isn't taking a nap. Again, we're looking specifically at this particular passage in the Old Testament of Genesis and the account of creation. So God's rest isn't taking a nap. And then number two, he's still resting to this day according to this particular passage of Scripture. He's still resting. So that's an interesting kind of dichotomy almost because we're saying that you know, his rest isn't the kind of rest that we think of, so he didn't really rest rest in our sense of thinking about it, but he's still resting to this day. He hasn't stopped resting. So what's the, how do those fit together? How can we piece those two, what seem like completely opposite ideas together? So, Let's put them together. This type of rest that we're talking about here and our type of rest cannot be the same type of rest. That's what we're getting at with the root of this this particular thing here. God's type of rest and our type of rest can't be the same type of rest. There's got to be a different type of rest going on here that we're talking about. Again, as I mentioned, our resting involves going to bed. God's resting does not involve going to bed, according to Scripture. let's, Let's flip over real quick to the New Testament. Let's keep going. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. All right, now this is Jesus preaching to the Galilean crowds after sending his 12 disciples out to do the same thing. Okay, he gathers, he gets the 12 disciples, he kind of gives them a little um, pep talk, if you will, and then sends them out to preach the gospel. And then Jesus continues his preaching as well. And he says this to the crowds. He says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So question, what was Christ talking about with this kind of rest? For your soul. So was he talking about a quit your job and come work for me type of rest? Like literally like, you know, stop fishing or, or, you know, making tents or whatever it is that you're doing over there, uh, metal work, and just come to me, work for me, I'll give you some rest. It'll be my, my yoke's a lot lighter than the whole metal working thing over there. Is that the kind of rest that he's speaking of here? And we kind of already have said, no, that's not the type of rest. There's a spiritual type of rest going on that he's talking about. Jesus is talking about something that's beyond the physical. And we know the Jews couldn't stop thinking about the physical. They were, they were stuck on it. They wanted a physical ruler in Jesus. They wanted the physical land back. They wanted physical rest on top of it from what they felt from the oppression but here jesus is speaking of a different kind of rest so again jesus's type of rest is different from our type of rest so we've got god's type of rest which god and jesus the same thing what a surprise their definitions of rest are different than ours here's an, here's here's kind of the the crucial point of this rest idea that's going on here The rest that we're speaking of, particularly, is the rest of salvation. That's kind of the grand reveal of the rest that's going on mentioned in Scripture here. That rest is only found in the gospel. And that type of rest rests us from being at enmity with God. That's what type of rest is going on here. What does the rest mean for me and my life, though, at this point? Because, so, yeah, we, and this was something I, I kind of wrestled with. I'm using so many R-sounding words right now. This is something I wrestled with with this study was 
they gave these you know, theological points of what, what rest is in God's eyes and what rest means for us as believers. And, and what, what, so how do I take that and then flip it over to my life and apply it to my, my walk, my daily walk? What does that mean for my resting? And, and as we just mentioned, the, the crucial point that comes out of the rest is the fact that our idea of rest is different from God's idea of rest. And we have to get on a similar wavelength of thinking about what rest is as God does. Rest is a spiritual thing. Now, there's a physical kind of rest that we have too. And as you well know, Jesus was fully man. He had to rest also. So what about that physical side of rest? How do we kind of pair these two together? What, what do you think the reason for God's rest being different than ours, like, imposes on our life? How does that, what should we think about that and how it should affect our rest in life? Okay, we've got two hands. Hers went up first. safe space. When my heart's in prayer mm -hmm. and is very anxious, I get scared, <coughs> unsure of everything. What do I do now? And I realize I had to leave it in God's hands. And it's going to be okay. And it was. years of marriage was a little hard to not have it anymore. That's a big shift. And once I realized I could leave it in God's hands to take care of me, everything fell into place. Now to me, that's what I get out of this in resting. That's an excellent in, in my heart. That's an excellent application to rest in the fact that you rested <clears throat> first spiritually through the gospel in your salvation right and then that trickles into your life and your rest from the things that happen to you and how you handle them and how you cope with them you can be at rest because of the rest that is there because of Jesus Christ Tom, I believe. Well, that's pretty much exactly what I, I was getting at when I, when I was doing this, too. Um, in Ecclesiastes, Solomon 5, there it says, but there's something missing. He, he, he didn't have the rest. He, you know, vanity of vanity, but if you don't have that, that fullness, that completion, so to speak, with Jesus, there's something missing. You, say, well, you don't have rest. Yeah. Yeah, and you can see that in um, you can see that in in life in general with how the world operates. They're constantly looking. <laughs> well, I mean, it's. I think of the retirement idea in in people's minds normally, and particularly in the sheriff's office, I, I've seen this uh, more than anything. Saw it over in the military too a lot, and. And I'm, I'm comparing this to my other job that's not, you know, a governmental type entity. And it's interesting, just the, the goal is retirement. Like, they just, I, most of them are just like, I'm coming one more day to get one more day closer to retiring when I can finally rest. And they're trying to find rest because there's not a lot of rest that the world offers to us. It's just not really there. You don't get rest out of the world. You get a rat race more and more and more. Again, that's where, like you were mentioning, God comes in. There's, he gives a rest that is only possible through him. You can only have through him. And it changes your view of 
your daily work. You know, you take that over to the sheriff's office. Well, you know, let's say someone becomes a Christian and they have a proper worldview. Well, now, you know, every day can be a day of rest, even if you go to work, depending on how you're viewing your situation. Retirement is just a new phase of life. It's not this ultimate rest that you finally get to. Nothing against retirement. I'd love to retire one day, preferably in two years. <laughs> Yes. Um, when I was there, if you start off talking in scripture, it's only you're not going to start talking every day. It's a totally different perspective. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, like, I mean, after you get closer, it's like, yeah. Scripture, but I'm telling you today. Yeah. And that's, so that's an, that's a very important, not, I'm not going to call it a counterpoint, but it's a parallel point, if, if you will, is that the rest of a retirement in life isn't a bad thing, right? We want to make sure that we get that point out there. It's okay to look forward to a rest from your work, but you're doing it through a different perspective as a believer. You, you don't have to have retirement to be at rest. Looking forward to a different type of work. Yes. Yeah, nobody in the Bible ever retired. No. Yeah. Back then, uh, pensions. <laughs> the mailbox, the mailbox deal. Let me look here at my notes. So, so what does this mean? These these points that we just mentioned here. What does this mean for me and my rest? I'm trying to to get this over to the physical portion of rest here in life. We we we've, we've been talking about the spiritual, but. Remember, this is a class about stewardship, and we're trying to be practical with these things. So how, how are we getting this over into the practical side of life, this idea of rest? And one main particular point comes out of this, and again, we're still under the, the heading of stewardship, stewarding our rest. Um, the big idea, the two there, letter C, um, I believe that's where I had this kind of nestled under and in. This, this big idea and what this means for me is that God designed rest for the purpose of glorifying himself. Okay, that's the purpose of rest. It's no surprise that rest is designed for his glory, considering everything is designed for his glory. So God designed rest for the purpose of glorifying himself. Therefore, my rest is intended to glorify and magnify God. Make sense? Does any, do we have any thoughts on that, that, that that's come to mind? exactly right. Do you have any other thoughts on that particular idea of rest being for the purpose, God-designed purpose of glorifying himself? Let me follow up with another question. How might this change the way we think about our own rest? Any takers? I got to get at least one. It's my quota. Yeah, 
Yeah, no, you're, you're, you're exactly right. The rest, there, for us as physical, temporal human beings, there's two sides to rest. There's what you just mentioned in an active rest. You can rest and not be asleep, right? That's the other side of rest. There's sleeping rest and there's an active rest. You can do both of them. And the point here, too, is that you can glorify God actually in both of them. Now, don't take that too far and um, think that, you know, well, my purpose in life is now to glorify God through 30 hours of sleep in two days. What is that, 15 hours a night at that point? It's going a little too far with this, but the, the point is, and I'd love to be in that, that crew. One, I, um, funny story, uh, it, it, we had a training session in the military uh, in California out in 29 Palms, and um, it was like two weeks long. And we came back, we were like sleeping in the field and stuff like that. And we came back and they put us in some dormitories and one, one guy from uh, our platoon, uh, he went to sleep when we got back like that morning and did not wake up again until the next morning. And we were like, what happened to you? And he was like, I got the full 24 hours, man. It was great, it was the best thing ever. Sometimes maybe 24 hours of rest is a good thing and you can glorify God in that. How else do you think though this idea of rest might change the way God's, God's purpose for rest might change the way we think about rest, your rest? My rest. I think Our rest. so that if Christ came and an individual wants to be told things to learn to learn that that creates rest in them and it's like no one's stopped us at some point in our ministry and we say take my yoke and learn that's kind of what we're talking about. Just a little rest a little, right? That was one of the points too, the lesson was the idea, and I might have notated this somewhere else in here, might be jumping ahead, but that's okay. Um, the sleeping type of rest, where you stop doing things, I'm the type of person that, while I love to get a good night's rest, I struggle to stop doing things when my to-do list is not completely checked off. And I can glorify God, a person like me can glorify God in putting the checklist down and resting in the fact that that was God's sovereign plan for the day. I didn't make it all the way through it. I can go to sleep and trust in him for the next day and for my night's rest. That's, you can actually glorify God in doing that. Josh? rest is so multifaceted. We get so locked into our idea of what rest is, and we usually think, oh, if I, if I rest, I'm not going to be glorifying God. I can't glorify God in my rest. That's not possible. I have to be uh, sweeping the floors at the church or something like that. Um, otherwise, God's not very happy with how I'm, I'm handling my, my life, and that's just simply not biblical. So, I'll answer the question the way that I wrote it down, which is basically a reiteration of the things that we have mentioned already. How does this change the way we think about rest? Well, number one, rest is no longer a negative thing. You know, to a person who's like me, again, you might not be like me. You might love rest and not think it's negative in most periods of time in your life. I'm always the guy who's like, I got to do one more thing and then I can rest dishes you know if there's a dish in the sink I have some sort of a weird like 
sixth sense that I can feel it in the sink and I it, like I can't sit down on the couch until it's clean and put over in the clean side rest is no longer a negative thing second point here is rest is actually actively glorifying God when used properly in the proper perspective it's kind of like, it really is like a mind blow type of a, you know, moment in theology as you open and crack open what rest is to God. It's, it changes the way we view our lives and our schedules. It really does. Here, there was an interesting thought exercise in the lesson, and I, I kind of modified it just a little bit, but wrote it out. Um, you, there's two options. You have two options. You can volunteer at the church whatever capacity that might be. Or you can go to a car show. Or they used a baseball game. Um, insert fun activity, essentially. And they asked two questions. And one was, why might the car show be a good stewardship of your time? And it was just... It's so counter to how, at least I think, first thoughts are, no, 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 no. There's a ministry opportunity. <laughs> that is the only way. What is the man? This is the way. <laughs> For any Star Wars geeks out there. Why might the car show actually be a good stewardship of your time? Think about that one for a second. I'll ask the second one, and, and you can think about this one too. Why might the stewardship of going to a car show be different from an unbeliever going to a car show? Or, or a, bless you, or a um, baseball game or something like that. Think about that. There's a difference in how we do rest as believers, and there should be, and that difference projects the gospel out to people. Now, that doesn't mean, okay, every time you have the opportunity to go to a car show or a baseball game or whatever, and there's ministry opportunity at the church that you always take the car show. Otherwise, the church would be a wreck. We've got to balance it, okay? We've got to balance it. I can't go to every cheesecake testing convention in Florida All right, so a conclusion on rest. Conclusion on rest. Number one, God's rest is a state of being that is only fully entered through Christ. Number two, God designed rest for the purpose of glorifying himself. And here's the key, through the proper use of it. Okay, through the proper use of it. And then a last kind of a point here on this one, and this really goes for the theme of stewardship, essentially. Motives, motives, motives. It's all about the motives behind the actions that determines the result of the stewardship in God's eyes. What are your motives? Because you can come to church and do church things and not glorify God. I can stand up here and have a message all beautifully created and color coordinated and, and, and you know, lined up and not glorify God, you know, in the least through my actions because of where my motives are and my heart is in it. There might be some glory that's projected, thank goodness, because of scripture that goes out there. But I might not be essentially, we'll say, pleasing God through my actions and my motives at that point because of my focus. Where's my focus? Is it selfish? Is it on the gospel? Let's look at stewarding our time. Now, we talked about rest there, so let's kind of, I feel like this is a backup almost. It's, it's weird how this one kind of went rest and then time. To me, time is over rest, but wh whatever. We're going to go to time, and this is going to be a shorter little section here. First thing we need to do when it comes to time, understand the weight of time. You have to understand the weight of time. You have to realize that time is the one resource that is impossible to create more of. 
you don't, you can't make more than 24 hours in a day. It's just not possible. There's no time machine yet. Elon Musk hasn't got there. I'm sure he's trying, but he hasn't got there yet. Time is the one resource that is impossible to create more of. You can shift things around in your schedule and free up time, but you can't get more time. You get 24 hours in a day, everybody. All right, stewarding our time. I want to move down to this one called uh, Christian hedonism. What is it? I can tell you right off the bat, I'll, I'll give you my perspective of this. This practical theology changed my life four-ish years ago when I came across this through um, John Piper's teachings and, and sermons and whatnot, this perspective on, on scripture, this perspective on God and our time essentially and how we act completely changed how, how I looked at life and my, my time essentially. Even as a believer, I was like, whoa, wait a second, I've been doing things a little wrong here. I've got some things mixed up. So I wanted to go over it because I feel like it's so crucial to, to uh, a Christian life. It's something to, to think very carefully about. So what is regular old hedonism? Anybody want to take a stab at that real quick? Riley? Self. Self. And self what? Self-centric. Five points, okay? Tally it up, you get five points. Anybody else want to add to that? What is hedonism? Going once, going twice. Merriam and Webster, uh, Mary, Merriam. How do you say, is it? It's Merriam, right? Yeah, it's Merriam. I don't know why I always want to say Mary men. I don't know why it's not Mary men, and I know that. I always want to say that. All right. Anyways, and Webster, you know, the first person in Webster, defines it as this, the doctrine that pleasure or happiness is the sole or chief good in life. That doesn't sound very Christian, <laughs> does it? That doesn't sound very Christian. That sounds very much so like the culture that we live in today. So why on earth would I say that Christian hedonism is a good thing before you throw me out? Let's continue. What is Christian hedonism? All right, now this is John Piper essentially came up with this, this phrase, this quote, all right? God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. What on earth do we think that means? Does anybody want to wanna try to like un untangle that? God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Let me reword it here. I'm going to kind of try to untangle it, if you will. When God, Jesus, the gospel, is your heart's treasure... See Luke 12, 34. So if you want to jot that down in your key, key scripture notes section over there. So when God, Jesus, the gospel, is your heart's treasure, Luke 12, 34, the desires you have are divinely placed in you. Another scripture you can notate, Psalm 34, 7. The desires you have are divinely placed in you for the purpose of glorifying God. Another scripture, 1 Corinthians 10.31. Okay, so I, I kind of created, you know, I untangled that with more scripture, essentially. And because, why is that, why is that, what is that, how can that be? When Christians pursue things that bring them joy, they are automatically glorifying God in the process. And again, we have to caveat that with making sure that these things are within the realm of scriptural goodness, if you will. There are certain things that you may want to do as a Christian that will not glorify God. But those things that are within the confines of scripture, those things bring glory to God.
That's a lot, right? When you take that in, it's a lot to think about. It changes how you think about life in general and how you do your actions and what your actions mean to God, what your desires mean between you and God. Notice that this theology changes the way we understand every choice we make. It teaches us that every use of your time, stewarding your time, can be an act of worship and glorification of God. That's what Christian hedonism, as John Piper defines it essentially, he's just given a name to what he's found in scripture is all that is. You glorify God through it. Example, washing your car. <laughs> I don't like doing that anymore. <laughs> I used to like doing that, and now I don't like doing that anymore. Washing your car can be a, a act of worship and glorifying God by worshiping him for the car that you have to wash. Going on vacation can be an act of worship and glorification of God by simply worshiping his beauty and creation around you. Playing a sport can be an act of worship and glorification of God by worshiping him with the physical abilities for the physical abilities you have to play that sport with. Going to work, I mean, just talking about retirement and stuff, going to work can be an act of worship and glorification because and by worshiping him with the income that he has given you. We can kind of go back to last week when we talked about money, right? When everybody likes to talk about money and giving back to the Lord. Th this one, though, I think that work one's always the hardest because you go to work and you're like, oh, man, another day of whatever that one task or two tasks is that might happen every single day you get there. And you're just like, I don't want to do that task again. For me, it's usually like emails or something. Um, Coming to church can be an act of worship. Whoa, mind blown, right? By worshiping God in song and fellowship with other believers, by paying attention in a sermon and worshiping God for the message from the teacher, going to bed can be an act of worship. By worshiping God, by trusting in his plan, despite your lack of time to finish everything that you had on your to-do list for that day. You guys get it? What that Christian, the idea of Christian hedonism is? Everything you do can be an act of praise and worship to God with proper perspective on who God is. And that all starts, of course, with you being in the Word and around the Word and around the people of the Word. That's how that's created. Does anybody have any thoughts that they want to throw out there on that one? I know I just gave a ton. Yes. It's understandable. I mean, the thing is with words, right? They come with certain connotations to them. They come with preconceived notions about them and how they're used over and over again. In another hundred years, the word hedonism might not exist anymore, right? It might be gone. They might have replaced it with a new word, uh, you know, named it after a person or something like that. So I can understand that. And I think me, I feel that too a little bit inside. And one thing that I I run through my brain when it comes to something like that is understanding that it, the word is just a word. It's, it's, it's the way that you use the word that makes the difference. There are certain words that are just intrinsically mean bad things only. This type of a word, the way I see it, is more of a word that's simply describing a 
train of thought, more so than an action that is bad. So depending on how you use the word and what you couple it with, that's my thinking on it. And I completely understand your, your, um, your hesitancy with it. Yes. You can definitely use different terminologies. It's the you can definitely use different terminologies. It's the go ahead. I, I think he was too trying to flip hedonism on its head, essentially. Just just completely flip it upside down. You think this means this? Well, let me flip it over for you and, and tell you what it really should mean, essentially. Okay. Um, good thoughts. I really appreciate the fact that you brought that up. That's that's That takes a lot of courage to do that, and that's good because other people are probably thinking that too. And to sit there and hash things out like that, that's how you learn. That's how people learn. Yes, exactly right. Okay, conclusion. Matthew 5.16, I'm going to leave you with a verse in close in prayer because we're over time. Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Let's, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truths of your word. And we thank you that despite how languages have changed over the years your word has never changed there's nothing different about it many languages have come and gone and and things have changed over time but your word is not and the principles of your word have not and we're as believers so grateful for that fact we have a rock we have an anchor we sing about it all the time here we have an anchor in you and your word so I pray that in stewarding our time and our money and everything else that you have given us, we would cling to you as the anchor for how to do it. And we ask these things in confidence, knowing your sovereignty. In Jesus' name, amen.